Bezrat Hashem, now seven asliach. Rochlis Yoshe, chapter four, Dan Machav Zechus, judging another favorably. In the first chapter of Pirkei Avos, the Mishnah tells us, judge every person favorably. Likewise, the Gemara says, with righteousness you should judge your fellow. In Vayikra 1915, this means that a person should judge his, his fellow man favorably. This implies that judging another favorably is a mitzvah del raisa, as opposed to a rabbinic obligation. The Gemara also states there are six mitzvahs that when a person fulfills them, he enjoys the fruits in this world, but the principle remains intact for him to enjoy in the world to come. One of them is judging one's fellow man favorably. One who judges his fellow man favorably is himself judged favorably by Hashem. Is a Shechina in Ruch HaKodesh not with you? They judge me unfavorably and do not judge me favorably, Chana said. So, Ravadi Yosef explains this encounter with Chana, and he says that this is an incident that teaches the importance of judging one's fellow favorably. The incident of the Baron Chana, the future mother of Shmuel Hanavi. The Kasav describes her prayers at the Mishkan in Shiloh with the words, and Chana, she was speaking of her heart. The Gemara expounds on this Kasav. She said, Ribona Shololam, you created woman with many limbs, none of which are for naught. You created eyes with which to see, ears with which to hear, a nose with which to smell and breathe, and a mouth with which to speak. For what purpose have you endowed me with breasts, if not in order to nurse an infant? Give me a son and I will nurse him. As she mentioned each body part in turn, she placed her hands over it. Ailey the Kohen Gadol found her manner of prayer quite strange. Thus he suspected that she was drunk. Therefore he said to her, Until when will you be drunk? In uh, Shmuel Aleph 114. Chana said, Shechina and Ruach HaKodesh isn't with you. For you judged me unfavorably and didn't judge me favorably. The Vilna Gon gives the following ingenious explanation of Ailey's error of judgment. Ailey was puzzled at Hannah's strange mode of prayer. He decided to use the Kohen Gadol's breastplate to inquire about the woman's character. The reply to such inquiries was received in the form of the letters on the breastplate's stones lighting up. In this case, the letters He, Kuf, Shin, Resh lit up. Ailey joined these letters to form the word Shikora, drunkard. However, he could just as easily have spelled the words Keshera, upright woman, or Kesara, akin to our mother Sara. Like Sara, the childless Chana was fervently praying for a child. This is what Chana meant when she, telling Eli, Shechina and Ruach HaKodesh aren't with you. In order to interpret the response properly, the coin Gadol must have the guidance of Ruach HaKodesh, to form the letters into the correct words. When Ailey understood his error, he apologized and blessed her. As the custom says, and Ailey answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel will grant your request that you have asked of him. In Shmuel Aleph 117. The Gemara in Brachos 31b learns from this that one who has falsely suspected his fellow of misconduct must not only apologize to him, to the one whom he had wrongly suspected, but must also bless him. If you see a Torah scholar commit a transgression at night, do not harbor ill thoughts of him the next day, for he has surely done teshuva. One who suspects innocent people of misdeeds is punished by being stricken in his body. The Gemara in Shabbos 127b relates several incidents that demonstrate the greatness of this mitzvah. The first incident, a man went down from the upper Galili and was employed by a certain homeowner in the south for three years. The text alternatively reads, there was an incident involving Rabbi Akiva ben Yosef, who was in the employment of Rabbi Eliezer ben Horkinus for three years. It seemed that this occurred while Rabbi Akiva was still an unlearned person, and at this time he already had a wife and children, as one may infer from Alas to Rabbi Nasan chapter 6. At the end of the three years, on the eve of Yom Kippurim, the worker said to his employer, Give me my wages, and I will go provide for my wife and children. The employer replied, I have no money. 
Said the worker, then give me my wages in the form of produce. The employer replied, I have none. The worker tried once more and said, then give me land. The employer replied, I have none. Said the worker, then give me livestock. The employer replied, I have none. The worker pressed on, then give me pillows and cushions. The employer replied, I have none. Unable to obtain his wages, the worker slung his belongings over his back and returned home dejectedly. After the festival of Sukkos, which occurs shortly after Yom Kippurim, the employer took the worker's wages in hand, along with three donkey loads of goods, one of food, one of drink, and one of various delicacies, and went to the worker's home. After they ate and drank, he paid the worker his wages. This requires study. Why was giving these extra gifts not a transgression, Rav Chaim Kanievsky asked, of the prohibition to pay interest? From the wording of the Gemara, it does not seem that these goods were included in the wages that the employer owed. You must say that this was permitted because the employer would have given these goods to him even without the delay of his payment. Perhaps because of the requirement to give gifts to one's hired worker upon the completion of his work, as the Chinuch writes in Mitzvah 482. He then said to the worker, When you said, Give me my wages, and I said, I have no money, of what did you suspect me? The worker replied, I said to myself that perhaps the opportunity to purchase merchandise at a low price came your way, and you bought it with the money that you would have otherwise given me. The employer continued, and when he said, give me livestock, and I said, I have no livestock, of what did you suspect me? The worker replied, I said to myself that perhaps they were rented to others. The employer asked further, and when you said, give me land, and I said, I have no land, what did you suspect me? The worker replied, I said to myself that perhaps it was leased to others. Said the employer, and when I said I have no produce, of what did you suspect me? The worker answered, I said to myself that perhaps you could not give it to me because it was not tithed. It is forbidden to give an unlearned person produce that has not yet been tithed. Continued the employer, and when I said I have no pillows or cushions, of what did you suspect me? The worker answered, I said to myself that perhaps my employer has consecrated all of his belongings to heaven. So we see that Rabbi Akiva progressively is choosing the more and more reasonable answer. He wasn't going straight to assuming that he consecrated all his belongings to heaven because that would be unreasonable. And the employer then exclaimed, Upon the divine service, which is a form of oath. So it was. I had vowed all my possessions to heaven because of my son Herkonos, who did not occupy himself in Torah study. And when I came to my colleagues in the south, they annulled all of my vows for me. And as for you, just as you have judged me favorably, so may the omnipresent judge you favorably. The second incident. There was an incident involving a certain kind man who ransomed a young girl, Israelis, from captivity. When they arrived at the inn where he and his students were to spend the night, he lay her down at his feet. The following morning, he immersed himself in a mikveh and then taught Torah to his students. Then he asked them, When I laid her down at my feet, of what did you suspect me? His students answered, We said to ourselves that perhaps there is among us a student who has not been sufficiently scrutinized by a Rebbe, and thus Rebbe cannot entrust the girl to our care. The kind man asked further, and when I immersed myself in the mikveh before teaching Torah, of what did you suspect me? Ezra enacted that one who has relations must immerse himself before uttering words of Torah, so there was cause to suspect that he had sinned with the girl, God forbid. His students replied, We said to ourselves that perhaps because of the exertion of travel, Rebbe experienced a seminal omission. Whereupon the kind man said to them, Upon the divine service, so it was. And as for you, just as you have judged me favorably, so may the omnipresent judge you favorably. The third incident. One time a communal matter made it necessary for the sages to approach a certain Gentile noblewoman, who was frequented by all the patricians of Rome for immorality. The sages said to one another, Who will go to represent us before this noblewoman? Rabbi Yeshua said to them, I will go. So Rabbi Yeshua and his students went to, their, to her home. As Rabbi Yeshua approached the door of her house, he removed his tefillin at a distance of four amos, which is about six to eight feet, and handed them to his students. Upon entering the house, he closed the door before them, so that they could not enter after him. 
This means he merely closed the door, not that he locked it, Rav Chaim Kanievsky says. Otherwise, this would prove that it is permitted to go into seclusion with a woman when it is a life-threatening situation, and this is a subject of debate among later authorities. After he left her house, he immersed himself in a mikveh and then taught Torah to his students. Then he asked them, when I removed my tefillin, of what did you suspect me? One may not have tefillin in the room during cohabitation. Hence, there was cause to suspect that he intended to sin with the noblewoman. His students answered, we said to ourselves that perhaps Rebbe is of the opinion that students may not bring holy articles into a defiled place. He then asked them, and when I closed the door and secluded myself with the woman, of what did you suspect me? They replied, we said to ourselves that perhaps there is a confidential government matter that must be discussed privately between him and her. Now Yeshua continued, and when I immersed myself in the mikveh before teaching Torah, of what did you suspect me? His students replied, We said to ourselves that perhaps some spittle spurted from a mouth onto Master's clothing. The spittle of a Gentile renders a garment contaminated through contact due to a rabbinic decree. Whereupon the kind man said to them, Upon the divine service, so it was. And as for you, just as you have judged me favorably, so may the omnipresent judge you favorably. The Midrash Avastar Rabbi Nasa on chapter 8 relates other incidents. A certain girl was once captured by idolaters, and there were two kind individuals who set out to ransom her. When they arrived, one of these kind men entered the chamber of harlots. When he came out, he asked his friend, of what did you suspect me? He replied, I said to myself that perhaps you went in to find out how much ransom money she was being held for. Whereupon the first man said to him, upon the divine service, so it was. And he added, just as you have judged me favorably, so may I Baruch Hu judge you favorably. Another incident involved a certain girl who was captured by idolaters and two kind men set out to ransom her. One of these kind men was caught and was also in prison. His friend went and brought back money and ransomed both of the prisoners. After the first kind man was freed, he requested of the other Easter alien that were present, put this girl in my custody and allow her to sleep fully clothed next to me on the bed. They did so. The following morning, he requested of them, arrange for me to be immersed in a mikveh, and arrange for the girl to be immersed in a mikveh. This they did as well. After this was done, the kind man asked those who arranged the immersions, when I requested to immerse, of what did you suspect me? They replied, we said to ourselves that during all those days that you were imprisoned, you must have been hungry and thirsty, and now that you have come back into the open air and have been able to satisfy your hunger, perhaps your body was warmed, and that caused a seminal omission. The kind man continued, and when I asked you to arrange immersion for this girl, or what did you suspect me? They said, we said to ourselves that during all those days that she was living among the idolaters, she was forced to eat their food and drink from their drinks. Now that she is free, we said to arrange her immersion, in order that she may be purified. Whereupon the kind man said to them, upon the divine service, so it was. And as for you, just as you have judged me favorably, so may the omnipresent judge you favorably. Similarly, the Gemara, Ta'anis 21b, relates, Abaye heard great praises about Abba the, bu- the bloodletter. One day, Abaye sent a pair of rabbis to test him. When they arrived, Abba sat them down, fed them, and gave them to drink, and provided woolen rugs for, the- rugs for them to sleep on at night. In the morning, the rabbis rolled up the rugs and took them. Then they went out to the marketplace where they met Abba. They said to him, Consider, Rabbi, how much were these... Are these, rug, are these rugs worth, and buy them from us. He replied, They are worth such and such. Said the rabbis, Perhaps they are worth more. Abba answered, This is the amount I purchased them for. They said to him, They are yours, and we took them from your house. After revealing that they were merely testing him, they asked, Please tell us, of what did you suspect us when we took the rugs? Abba replied, I said to myself that a case of ransoming captives must have come to the attention of the rabbis and the money was needed to pay the ransom, but the rabbis are too embarrassed to tell me about it and to ask for the money openly. That is why you went through this entire charade to get me to give you the money. They said, now that you know, take them back, Rebbe. He said to them, from that moment that I concluded that you needed the money for ransom, I put them out of my mind and I assigned them to charity. In truth, the expression may the omnipresent judge you favorably, which appears in many of these incidents, requires further study. A Kaddish Baruch who knows the truth about one's actions and intentions. So where is the room for judging favorably? The answer to this question is, in everything a person does, there are always some aspects of merit to his deeds. And this blessing asks 
that Hashem should judge us favorably based on those points. As the Gemara says, even if 999 heavenly accusers are asserting his guilt, and one heavenly advocate asserts his merit, and even when that one Malach sets forth 999 indicators of guilt, and only one indicator of merit, the person will be saved. See Shmir Salashon, Part 1, Shara Tafuna, Chapter 4, which takes a similar approach of Chaim Kanigoski says. If we would all be careful to judge others favorably, we would avoid a great deal of disagreement and quarrels. As Rashi Peshawas 127b states, judging one's fellow favorably is included in the mitzvah of bringing about peace. Once a person judges his fellow in a favorable light and says to himself, my friend did not wrong me in this matter, it was beyond his control, or perhaps he had good intentions, then there will be peace between them. Fortunate is the one who is conscientious about this always.